Ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, please. Welcome to the afternoon session of the Symposium on Democracy. I'm going to introduce in one moment Derek Daly, a student of Westminster, the founder of the Westminster Poverty Initiative, who will introduce our speaker. Before I do so, a couple of small housekeeping announcements or improvements with a question and answer session after the speaker has spoken. There are two microphones to facilitate your questions. The one to my uh, left, to your right, is a fixed mic. If you are on this side of the auditorium, please make your way down to it to ask your question. If you are on the other side of the auditorium, the microphone will be roaming around and will come to you. Without further ado, let me introduce Derek Daly, the founder of the Westminster uh, Poverty Initiative, who will introduce our speaker. At the close of this day, in many silent corners of our world, 26,000 children will die from poverty-related illnesses. And currently, at least 80% of all humanity lives on less than $10 a day. Now, while many of us hear these figures, our lives are not moved by them. And we, when we are not moved, we don't act. Thankfully, Art Simon was. As a result of the calamity that is plaguing people everywhere, Art Simon was motivated 35 years ago to answer his call to service. In 1974, in a Manhattan parish, she founded and launched what U.S. Senator Olympia Snow describes as the nation's foremost leader on anti-hunger policy advocacy. Bread for the World currently has over 61,000 members and has led the cause for the successful passage of such legislation as the 2008 Farm Bill, which provided states and local communities with millions of dollars in resources to curb the tide of poverty and hunger. The Washington Post recently reported that Bread for the World leverages $1.2 billion annually for anti-poverty prevention. Art Simon is originally from Eugene, Oregon, and he attended seminary at Concordia in St. Louis. He has served several congregations, including the low-income communities in New York's Lower East Side in Manhattan. In his new books, he spends quite some time reflecting on those experiences and the experiences he shared with his brother, Paul Simon, former United States Senator from Illinois. Those experiences, along with his time in Eugene, Denver, Colorado, St. Louis, and New York, have shaped his worldview, and they ultimately led him to create Bread for the World. Art Simon has continuously challenged people everywhere to become active participants in the fight to end hunger and poverty in our lifetime. As a result of his courage and his long-standing commitment to anti-hunger advocacy, I myself have taken up the cause, along with several Westminster students. Since the summer of 2008, I have been actively involved in Bread for the World in my hometown of Little Rock, in here in Missouri, and in Washington, D.C. This past summer, a delegation of Westminster students traveled to D.C. to take part in the 2009 Bread for the World gathering, the 35th anniversary celebration, and the 2009 Lobby Day on Capitol Hill. We have since started the Westminster Poverty Initiative, an effort to mobilize students, faculty, staff, and community members to become actively involved in eliminating the world's greatest injustice against humanity. At the close of this talk, the Poverty Initiative will be leading a breakout session, and I would encourage everyone who has moved to service and moved to action to join us in the Coulter Science Center Lecture Hall. Art Simon's work and vision has impacted people across the world, and that is reflected in a much uh, detailed book, um, his newest book, The Rising of Bread for the World, An Outcry of Citizens Against Hunger. This book tells the story of bread's beginning and history and how ordinary people make extraordinary differences against hunger and poverty. Immediately following this talk, Art Simon will be available in the Champ Atrium to greet those interested and sign books. Lastly, I want to mention that Art Simon is a recipient of the Presidential Hunger Award uh, for Lifetime Achievement, and he has received numerous honorary degrees. Art Simon has led a life of service, and today he is here to challenge us all to do the same. Please join me in giving Art Simon a big Blue Jay welcome.
Thank you very much, Derek. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Forsyth and Dr. Havers, Dr. Perry, distinguished guests, and I include my wife Shirley in that. And most of all, students, thank you for being here. Um, I want to uh, thanks. Uh, I want to <laughs> I want to thank you, Derek, for that uh, generous introduction. The the book. The book normally sells for $16.95, but I noticed out on the table we're offering it at the special rate of $17 today. So, but I'm afraid that Derek has um, uh, given me credit for what a lot of other people have done. And I, I say that because the truth is Thousands and thousands of ordinary citizens, but committed citizens, have been the driving force behind everything that Bread for the World has accomplished. And uh, so if you're a member of Bread for the World, or if you're a member of, or a part of the Westminster uh, poverty Initiative, uh, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, and if you're not a part of either of those, I want to do everything in my power this afternoon to persuade you to become an advocate for hungry people. Uh, first of all, I would like to demolish the myth that hunger is such a vast, unsolvable problem that there is little or nothing that any of us can do to help bring it to an end. Uh, the truth is that you can have a very substantial part in helping to bring hunger to an end. And I, I think that the story of bread for the world uh, documents that. Uh, the story for me began in my childhood, as Derek has uh, suggested. Uh, my brother Paul and I grew up learning that life was a gift from God and was intended to be given back to God. That in Jesus, God was reconciling us to himself with a redeeming love that compels us to love others and to seek justice for them. And my parents didn't just teach this, they lived it. Uh, I remember when I was an 11-year-old boy, just a few weeks after uh, Pearl Harbor. The nation rounded up all the U.S. citizens of Japanese descent who lived on the West Coast and put them in prison camps. It was a very popular but shameful action. And my father was one of the few who spoke out publicly against it, in, at least in our town. He spoke on the local radio station, he wrote in the newspaper, he spoke from the pulpit. Today there is a memorial in Eugene to those citizens uh, on the very spot where many of them were rounded up. And a few weeks ago I visited it for the first time and I saw stone with my father's name on it, uh, and these simple words inscribed, he spoke in protest, his courage inspired others. And thanks to my parents, uh, our family got involved in a race relations organization back in the late 1940s, 
years before the civil rights movement began to emerge. And these were just some of the things that I describe in the book that were foundational uh, for us as we were growing up that prepared Paul for a career that led ultimately to the U.S. Senate and, and my role in the founding of Bread for the World. Well, I became a parish pastor and I spent, as Derek said, most of my parish ministry years in New York City on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a very crowded and economically poor neighborhood. The precinct I lived in and the church was situated in was less than a square mile, but had more than 100,000 people, most of them living in old law, five-story old law tenements. We had all the problems that you typically associate with a poor urban neighborhood like that. High crime rate, a lot of drug addiction, school dropouts, broken homes, and the like. And a lot of people running out of food. Well, my job was that of a parish pastor, to preach the gospel, to gather a community of believers around word and sacrament. But in doing that and getting acquainted with, in the neighborhood and visiting people, I ran into one problem after another. And as a congregation, we tried to respond with emergency assistance. But I found that the harder, the harder we worked at it, the farther behind we got. And it began to sink into us that there must be a better way. We must do more than just direct assistance if we're going to enable people to escape the grip of hunger and uh, poverty. Uh, my, my father used to tell us when we were kids, better to build a fence at the top of the cliff than to have an ambulance uh, at the bottom. And um, we were driving the ambulance all the time. Bread for the world emerged as a way of building that fence. I, um, I invited a group of seven Catholics and seven Protestants to come together. Churches everywhere were engaged in direct assistance, much as ours was uh, in different ways. Uh, but almost nothing was being done to challenge Christians to use the gift of their citizenship and the power they have as U.S. citizens to make an impact on the nation's decision makers and on national policy that has an impact on hungry people. And so the 14 of us set about to figure out how we might mobilize a nationwide nonpartisan outcry of citizens against hunger. And so uh, Bread for the World was born 35 years ago and quickly became the nation's foremost citizens lobby on hunger because it was the only citizens lobby on hunger. Now, I use the word lobby in quotation marks because bread for the world is not your ordinary lobby. We do not wine and dine office holders. We do not contribute to political campaigns. We don't endorse candidates. Um, we're not out there trying to enhance our own financial well-being. We are simply a group of committed Christ citizens of conscience who want to help the nation address more effectively some of the causes of hunger and poverty, both here and worldwide. Well, you may ask how does it work in real life? Let me give you just a few examples. Back in the 1980s, UNICEF, 
United Nations Children's Fund and uh, the World Health Organization launched what was called the Children's Health Revolution because it was discovered that the use of a few simple, inexpensive techniques or methods such as promotion of breastfeeding and immunization could dramatically reduce the high death rate of infants and young children in developing countries. At the time, UNICEF estimated that 40,000 young kids below the age of five died each day from malnutrition and diseases often related to malnutrition. 40,000 a day. That's the numerical equivalent of a hundred jumbo jets, each loaded with 400 little kids crashing to the earth, leaving no survivors. One every 14 minutes. So bread for the world, drafted proposed legislation that was introduced in Congress proposing the establishment of a child survival fund within our foreign aid program to give that children's health revolution a boost. And I can tell you that when that legislation was introduced in Congress, nobody paid any attention until the letters started coming into congressional offices. First a trickle, then a flow, then an avalanche as the campaign built and people got excited and involved. And Congress did establish a child survival fund in our foreign aid program. And that fund, that part of our foreign assistance has grown over the years. The last I saw was a figure of $1.7 billion for child survival and children's health, a slightly broader category than just child survival. But as a result of the action of Congress, uh, not only did the U.S. contribution make a difference, but other nations were uh, stimulated to uh, step up to the plate and, and make similar contributions. And um, consequently, today there are not 40,000, but as Derek said, 26,000 kids who die each day in developing countries, despite a growth in population among children there. Now, still a scandal. We still have a long way to go, but we've made significant progress. Five million fewer kids die each year than did a couple of decades ago. And it happened largely because ordinary citizens, folks like you, were willing to write a letter to your U.S. congressman, U.S. representative, and your U.S. senators urging them to support child survival. Jim Grant, the uh, director of UNICEF at the time and uh, international champion of child survival, called Bread for the World, uh, leading citizen's voice in translating the idea of child survival into effective action. Uh, it's very clear that on average, each letter sent to a member of Congress in support of child survival has had the effect of saving literally dozens and more likely hundreds of lives. And we are inclined to say what I do won't make any difference. Well, there is a kind of 
domestic U.S. counterpart to international child survival, and that is the WIC program, the Women, Infants, and Children Supplemental Feeding Program. Um, Bread for the World and others have been pushing this over the years to improve it, to expand it, and I'm happy to say that today, nine million infants and toddlers and pregnant and lactating mothers, all in need, are getting a lifeline from the WIC program. And again, it happened largely because folks like you were willing to send that message to your leaders on Capitol Hill. Uh, now, I want to be honest with you. I don't want to give the impression that Bread for the World simply goes from one victory to another. Uh, let me tell you, we have to fight for every inch of headway that we make. And sometimes we take a beating. We have setbacks. Back in the 1980s, we took a beating on the food stamp program. Instead of improving and expanding the program, which was which helps uh, millions and millions of hungry people in this country. Uh, that program was being cut back sharply. Uh, and despite our best efforts, we lost ground during the 80s on the food stamp program. We made headway overall, but we had setbacks. Derek mentioned the Farm Bill and some successes we had on that last year, and that's true. But we also lost a very key part of the Farm Bill that we wanted to reform, and that was those huge subsidies to wealthy farm holders who gain a disproportionate share of U.S. subsidies and distort the international market so that small farmers in developing countries are squeezed out of a livelihood. We came very close to winning this time, and we hope that next time we're going to be able to win that one. But I have to tell you, we, we lost it last year on that. And there are other things that we've struggled with and moved forward two steps, one step back. And uh, that's the way it goes. Overall, a lot of headway, but not without a lot of struggle. We are currently working hard this year and next to re reform and streamline our whole foreign aid program. And we would like next year to be able to have Congress do a total rewrite of that program. It hasn't been rewritten since 1961, almost a half century ago. And since then, there have been a host of amendments, some good, some bad, you know, many different agencies sometimes working at cross purposes. Uh, we think that whole thing needs to be streamlined, much more focused, particularly on, on poverty and hunger reduction uh, and other, and other uh, policies outside of the aid program uh, that will work in harmony with efforts to uh, end hunger. Uh, in that connection, we have pushed for presidential intervention to launch a, a government-wide study to uh, re-examine our whole approach to global development. And I'm pleased to say that just a few weeks ago, uh, my successor at Bread for the World, David Beckman, got a call from the White House saying that President Obama had just signed a directive uh, uh, setting in motion precisely that kind of, of government-wide uh, uh, study uh, led by uh, the White House. So we have a huge opportunity in front of us. The U.S., by reshaping our foreign aid program and making it much more effective, could make a huge step toward the ending of hunger. Well, I've given you a few snapshots here. Um, 
but maybe enough to challenge the myth that that hunger is just beyond reach and not much we can do about it. When I was a boy growing up in Oregon, President Roosevelt used to talk about the two-thirds of the world that was hungry. When Bread for the World began 35 years ago, it was about one-third. A couple of years ago, it was about 15 percent. It's true that we've seen recent setbacks because of the spike in food and energy prices and the global recession. But overall, we have seen huge progress against hunger. In my own lifetime, in one lifetime, we have seen an exodus out of hunger on the part of most of the world's population. Think of it. That is a huge historic development. And I believe it is the work of God. And I believe that God wants us to complete that exodus. But even if you don't think of it as a work of God, surely it is the right thing to do. It is a cause worth seizing. And that's where you come in, because you can make a difference. Um, the opportunity is there, and it's up to each one of us to seize it. Uh, you may choose to remain silent. And if you do, you will be casting your vote for the status quo, for keeping things as they are, for locking people into hunger. But if you are willing to raise your voice, if you are willing to send a message, a letter, an email, a phone call, a visit to your U.S. representative, to your U.S. senators from time to time on key hunger issues, you can be a part of an effort that can eventually lead to a nation and a world without hunger. The choice is yours. Now, you may disagree with what I've said uh, and walk away. I would regret that, but respect it. But if you're willing to be part of those who are registering your opinion in favor of reducing and ending hunger. Then you will be part of bringing it to an end. And as I say, the choice is yours. Well, that's basically what I want to say this afternoon, but um, let me suggest that one immediate possibility is that breakout session that uh, Derek mentioned earlier. Um, the name of that session is Change Your World Through Action, Westminster's Student-Led Poverty Initiative. And I should say, though, on one printed description, I'm leading that session. That's not true. Derek is. This is a student-led uh, project, uh, or poverty initiative. Derek, along with Jackie Sanders and Andrew Kincaid, um, I met them last summer in Washington. They got some personal experience on Capitol Hill. And uh, this poverty initiative offers a way in which you as students can uh, join with 
local churches and other local people to uh, get at some of the causes of hunger and poverty. And uh, the Poverty Initiative and this workshop can show how you can impact the lives of poor and hungry people through direct service and advocacy. So I hope that you will uh, consider being part of that initiative. And uh, I should say also, I want to thank those students who are spearheading that initiative. I, hey, let's give them applause. And uh, I also want to uh, mention, I can't see you very well from up here, but uh, two of our Bread for the World staff, uh, regional, uh, our regional organizer, Levita Davis, and the regional field organizer, Zach Schmidt, are here. And uh, they've been working with uh, Derek and the other students. And uh, they'll be around, I'll be around the rest of the day. And we'll be happy around the edges to uh, talk to you. And of course, Derek and Jackie and Andrew will our students here, and they'll be here all the time. So I think with that, uh, let's throw it open to. I'd be happy to respond to any questions you might have, and um, we'll go from there. Okay, I. My visibility is near zero up here, so when you come to a mic, if we'll just trade from one mic to the other, if that seems to be a fair way. Okay, please. <laughs> Would you repeat that question? <laughs> There we are. Hey. <laughs> I told you my visibility was poor. Oh, great. Well, I don't know that I can answer that in terms of any quantity of a role that religion should play. Clearly, religion should play the role of compassion and uh, uh, reaching out to others. Uh, and by compassion, I include both direct, you know, charity and justice, you know, direct private assistance and ways of making life more fair for those who are who tend to be cut out. I just think that that's, that's certainly basic to Christianity, it's basic to Judaism, basic to Islam. Uh, I think you know, it's basic to any uh, respectable religion. And sure, that should motivate us to do the kinds of things that will make for a better world. Please. Is this thing on? Okay, good. Um, you mentioned assisting with the WIC program and food stamps and different um, kind of short-term programs. And I just wondered, in addition to lobbying and changing laws, um, what are long-term programs do you work with or have established to aid in long-term assistance of independence to end poverty? Uh, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of echo here. And I'd, I I'm an old man and I don't hear too well. Okay, no, it's okay. I wrote it down. Um, you mentioned assisting with the WIC program and food stamps. And I just wondered what um, long-term programs do you have in place or have established or do you work with to aid in long-term assistance to end poverty as opposed to the short-term food stamps and go temporary solutions? Okay, okay. Uh, if I heard this correctly, it's, I mentioned food stamps, but besides the short-term efforts to uh, deal with hunger, what are we doing in terms of long-term initiatives? And that's a, an excellent question. I should say the food stamp program 
is no longer called the food stamp program, although I refer to it that way because it's familiar to us, but now it's called the SNAP program, um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And uh, there are no more stamps there now, you know, very uh, uh, highly carefully coded cards like credit cards that are used. Uh, and uh, the fact of the matter is that our, that our nutrition programs like SNAP and WIC, they are the fastest and the most immediate, quickest way in which we could basically end hunger in the States. And it is, it, it is, it is shameful and scandalous that it, a nation as rich as ours doesn't do that, you know, for a very relatively small uh, amount uh, it could be done and we could virtually, uh, we could end most hunger rather quickly. However, the long-term way of, of the, and the preferred way of ending hunger over the long pole is to enable people who uh, can work to have jobs and to earn enough to support themselves and their families. One of the initiatives that Bread for the World is, has uh, in line for next year one of the campaigns we'll wage has to do with the earned income tax credit. And uh, the earned in income tax, Bread for the World has over the years uh, played a significant role in boosting that uh, uh, program. Uh, and it has helped to lift uh, millions of working poor people above the poverty line. So it is a way of, it is a way of honoring work and rewarding work, and then at the same time lifting people above. So that's, that's the way we uh, should go as much as we possibly can. Uh, my question is one that I think that a lot of Americans, when we talk about issues like global poverty, global hunger, it's a question that we don't like to address, but I think that it always needs to be addressed. Do you believe that in a world of limited resources, there is a line that needs to be drawn where we help people in our own country before we help others, and where do you think that line needs to be drawn, if at all? Yeah, where do you draw the line between helping people in our country and, and helping people abroad? I don't think there is a scientific line that can be drawn there. Uh, I don't believe either that, that it is an either or. It is not a question of uh, do we help ourselves or do we help others? If we turn our backs on others, we're also turning our backs on our own people. I mean, we live in a very interrelated world, and we're seeing today, even in our foreign policy, that um, military strength does not answer all the problems. Even our Secretary of Defense is saying we've got to do more with a soft answer uh, in international affairs, meaning we have to do more to make sure that people are not by their misery, by their poverty, you know, driven to uh, extremes that create the seedbed for terrorists or the seedbed for war. Uh, we have the capacity, we have the wealth as a nation to be eliminating hunger here at home, but we also have the capacity simultaneously to take leadership, not to do it alone at all, but to take leadership in helping the world to uh, reduce and end hunger. Please. I, I'm sorry, again, I didn't get the first part of that particularly. Um, could you elaborate on your efforts to reduce or eliminate the uh, formal subsidies oh. in the U.S.? Yeah, the, uh, 
the subsidies that have gone to um, uh, the heavily skewed toward uh, particularly certain grain crops and cotton and uh, tend to reward most uh, the wealthiest landowners. And um, it's just, you know, it was a program that was begun during the Depression to rescue family farmers from, uh, from ruin. And over the years, it has evolved not into a program that doesn't basically help small family farmers so much as it helps large wealthy landowners who are not really in need of uh, being subsidized. Uh, often it is called, um, you know, welfare for uh, the rich, and I think that's a legitimate uh, description. Unfortunately, it has the effect of um, stimulating farmers to produce more and have the ability to sell it at a market price that is lower than it otherwise would be, and that undercuts the market for small family farmers in countries such as Latin America in Africa and Asia. And uh, therefore, it becomes a cause of hunger rather than as the original intent was to prevent uh, hunger and poverty, uh, at least in rural America. OK, no more questions. I think I've answered them all. Oh. One more. I regret to say I, I couldn't get catch all of that. And uh, again, I, I plead old age. You may hear better down there than I do up here, but. Uh, um, No, I don't think that's the case. I don't think we're in the position at all of, um, you know, the, the problem is, the problem of unemployment uh, here, for example, is not that we're doing too much to help people abroad. That's not the problem at all. You know, we're, uh, we, I think that means oh, I think that means my time is up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Art Simon and Derek Daly, thank you very much.